Hello again everybody, and today we are going to be talking about the ancient Slavic calendar. Now there are many calendar systems in use in the world today, and there are even more if we go further back in time. In the West we use what is known as the Gregorian calendar, which in 1582 replaced the Julian calendar. And the Julian calendar had been in place since the times of Julius Caesar, and he put that calendar into effect in 46 BC. The Chinese use a different calendar, and on their calendar it is currently the year 41, no, 4717. And this associates, as we know, a different year with different animals and different elements. The year in which these calendars place us in has a massive degree variance depending on which one we use. So the Jewish calendar puts the year at 5781 for example, and the Indian calendar places the date exactly 57.6 years ahead of us on a Gregorian calendar. Now these calendars are more or less fairly well known, and when we think of ancient calendars we usually think of the Mayan calendar, which as you know was supposed to chronicle the end of days in 2012, and I'm sure we know how that went. But in 1944 scientists made the discovery of a far older and a far more accurate calendar even when compared to our own interpretation of the modern date and time, and the calendar I'm talking about is the Slavic Aryan Vedic calendar which places the current year at 7529 from the creation of the Star Temple, eh, from the creation of the world in the Star Temple. Now, the full day as of recording this video, uh, as far as the Slavic Aryan calendar is concerned, the full date is the year 7529, and the ninth summer in the circle of life on the 35th daylet of the month, which is known as Tritanic. This calendar was in use throughout Russia and Eurasia, Eurasia until Peter I, I refused to call him Peter the Great, had a reform and he converted the entire country to Christianity and as such changed the date to be counted from the birth of Christ as opposed to the creation of the world in the Star Temple. Now there's very little written about this in modern times however if you go to the P Peter the First Wikipedia page you can see here in 1699 Peter changed the date of the celebration of the new year from the 1st of September to the 1st of January. Traditionally years were reckoned from the purported creation of the world and after Peter's reform they were counted from the birth of Christ. Thus, in the year 7270 of the old Russian calendar, Peter proclaimed that the Julian calendar was in effect and the year was 1700. Now, although we knew about the existence of this calendar, because of Peter's reform there was very, very, very little written documents until in the 1940s scientists begun the translation of these documents here, the Slavic Aryan Vedas, which were golden tablets that, that need, needed translation into Russian. They've still not been translated into English and as today only one of them has actually been translated into Russian. Now as we can see here there were still some accounts uh, of the true date. In fact there was, there was a few despite the censors going about and destroying any evidence of this calendar having ever existed. One of the, the best ways of controlling a people is to, to take away their history and one of the best ways to take away their history is to, to deny their most significant event and it's usually a significant event that these calendars start their count from. This extremely complex and accurate calendar requires no adjustment for leap years and runs in perfect cycles. This calendar shows that not only the, the history of the Slav people extends back far further than what mainstream historians would tell us, including their written language, but also speaks volumes for the development of these people as any calendar requires the usage of written records and observation of celestial events. For the calendar to have reached the date of 7208 before changing uh, it shows that the people remained unified for this entire time under one empire and that the same calendar was used throughout. Here we can see a, a monument where the date is written as 7162. So you can see that even after this reform, not everybody followed under the new calendar. Now, I am not getting into the etymology of words because I'm sure there is many people that study Latin that would argue with me. However, the name for this calendar as we know it is Kalyadidar, which when translated means the gift of Kolyada. Kolyada being the person that designed this calendar in the first place. 
Now this sounds not only like extremely like the modern day word of calendar, but so do many Indo-European words when looked at from an etymological perspective. And without going into it here, I believe that this gives us a true hint to the root in many of our modern languages today. This is the Nikolsky Cemetery in St. Petersburg, and again you can see the date written, although it's not very clear, 7180. You name a single other race, a single other people, a single other country, nation, whatever you want to call it, empire on the face of this planet that has a history, a written, recorded history, stretching back seven, nearly seven and a half thousand years. Uh, it's the oldest calendar that exists on the face of this earth and it makes the, the Mayan calendar look like a baby. So going back to, to the date in which this calendar begins, this will require a video on itself, but I kind of just throw it out there without explaining it. The, the creation of the world in the Star Temple. We must ask ourselves what this means. What event could have been so significant to the people at the time that they began a new calendar? They, they started to count from that date and stuck with it for over 7,200 years until the calendar, along with their history, was stolen out from underneath them. The creation of the world was nothing. The creation of the world in the Star Temple was nothing more than the conclusion of a millennia-old war, and the signing of a peace treaty between the two nations involved. The ancient Slavic Aryan Empire, which we know under its most modern name, Great Tartaria, and Cathay, or ancient Aramea, which we now know as China. This is the the Alexander Cemetery in Saint Petersburg, and again, if you look closely, if I've not lost it, where are we? Where are we? There is a date in here. Somewhere. I can kind of see it, I'll show you here. 7,188. So back to the, the creation of the world in the Star Temple. Asura, the, the Prince of the Senya as it was known at the time, we still speak about Asura today, however, we know him as the Hindu deity Hanuman. He ruled in Belvodai and Aramean, the, the ruler of Aramea or ancient China, created peace. That is, they concluded a peace treaty between the great race and the great dragon, according to which they defeated Aramea's Bull of Wall, this wall we know today as the Great Wall of China. Uh, the wall at the time, however, was called Kitai, which when translated means Ki, Great and Tai Wall. And this also explains how on all these ancient maps we see China referred to as Kathai or Kithai. Uh, it was a high fence or fortress wall. China at the time was known as the Great Wall or the Great Fence. The Kitai Garod in Moscow, for example, is not named because of any Chinese connection, it's named because of the Great Wall that surrounds it, the High Wall. You can see here there are numerous examples of, of this day extending further. This is uh, the, the Orthodox Cemetery in St. Petersburg, again 7,388 they are putting the date out there. Now, the symbol for this victory, the sign of this peace treaty, is still known today. Uh, like any or most Christian iconography and Christian Christian mythos, it was pinched and stolen for the pagans, pinched and stolen for the people that came before them. And this symbol, the, the, the victory over Cathay, is the, the symbol of St. George. It's a white knight on horseback striking down a dragon with a spear. This is Arcus Einhard, he's drawn from the 17th century and, what's that, in the top left corner, but a griffin. And again, I'm sure you all remember the, the symbol of the, the, the Chinese flag, the, the, the Chinese animal was a dragon. I'll show you it right now. This right here is the same dragon that St. George struck down. I don't think any of us believe that he actually fought a dragon. I think it's far more likely that it was metaphorical and that metaphor being the structure. Now these are the Slavic Aryan Vedas that I was talking about and I have a copy of one of the translations here but if you don't speak or read Russian then I can only wish you good luck because there is no English translation and like I said the, the Russian translation, only part of it has been translated into Russian but these were discovered in the early 40s and translated in the mid 40s. Just to show you another another couple of photos of St. George, this is the Grey Hours book, this is the 14th century, 1400s, and we can see that he is, is a black knight on white horseback striking down the dragon, a black dragon, which was 
what the river, the, the river of the Black Dragon, which was the, the name of the river that ran through Manchuria uh, back in the day. This is the fresco, the fresco Yanga Church in Gotland, Sweden, 15th century, and you can see the same image. However, there's there's clearly something that they wanted to hide in this panel because it has been erased. It's not water damaged. You can see it's quite a specific area that they have deleted, and I wonder, I wonder why. This is the fourth century, far before any other depiction of Saint George appeared. So we know that this story is is of Saint George is not the true one, and this is Horus and Palin set. We have uh, another one of St George this time from the 11th century and this time it is not a dragon that he is impaling but a person. So again I think it's quite safe to assume that the, the story of St George impaling the dragon and killing it was metaf metaphorical and used to represent the destruction of the Chinese Empire as the black dragon was the, the symbol of the Chinese Empire. Again a Roman carving for the 4th or the 5th century and this time he is striking down a person. And the same again here, in a 10th century uh, carving in a Georgian church. So going by the date of this calendar alone, it is safe to assume that this is the oldest calendar in the history of mankind, and as a result, the oldest empire, because you can't have a, a, a calendar without a single unified people following it. You can't have a calendar without rec written records for that entire time. And again, if there was a new empire, as was shown quite, quite easily when P P Peter I took over, they changed the calendar in order to destroy the true history of the people. Despite this being the oldest calendar in the history of the world, mainstream historians are eerily quiet about it, and uh, many people in the West didn't even know that this calendar existed. Again, 7,391 they're putting the data there, and it blows my mind to think that there is a, a, a written history this far back. Or there was a written history before it was destroyed because obviously for a calendar to have extended as far as 7,000 years there needs to be written records and we do not have what I would say is 7,000 years worth of written records. But again, like I said, the start of any calendar uh, marks an important event in the, the history of the people that use it. And the first step of destroying and removing any memory of this significant event is to destroy the, the calendar that the people use or to deny the existence of that calendar. This shows that Peter I was, was not a Russian Tsar, he wasn't a Russian ruler, he was nothing more than a conqueror who sought to oppress and cover up the history of the, the Slavic people and as such the oldest empire in the world. This is a book from 1914 called The Chronicles of War and you can see that even in 1914 they had to still satisfy the people that were using the old calendar system because 1914 also represents 7422 from the creation of the world in the Star Temple. Another edition of this book, and again, 7,493 they are putting this book out because it was published a year later. This is another gravestone and that's 1995, so you can see the orthodox orthodox people, or the, some of them still refer to themselves as Englings, use this calendar to this day, 7,503 they put this, this day at. This one here is 7,180, and as you can see there are still a fair few examples of this calendar uh, or people using this calendar floating about, 7,376. Now this is the Tamuta Karen Tamuta Rakin Stone. Sorry, I got that one wrong, and I will just tell you a wee bit about the new. I'll show you a couple of pictures. Tamuta Rakin Stone, and the inscription itself reads, if I can show you, the text of the inscription reads, of the indication, Prince Gleb, in the year 6776, Prince Gleb measured the sea on the ice from Tumutarakin to Korchev, 10,004,000 uh, 10, fathoms, 6,576. So this isn't a made up calendar, this is a calendar that has existed far longer than any calendar we use today. Here's another book I've shown you guys before, and what is the date there? That is 7,156. This is the Garden of Tombs, and you can see that, that, look at this building, it looks eerily reminiscent of the Tartarian architecture we see. And I'm sure that once upon a time it stood tall and proud with an antenna on the roof. But what are the dates that we see here? 7,130, 7,111, 7,111, and 7,113. 
So guys, I just thought I'd do a wee quick video on the Slavicarian calendar. This will require a part two. This is an extremely complicated calendar, it's an extremely complicated system, but also a perfect one. It requires no adjustment for leap years, it requires no adjustment to time, there's no fractional dates. The day is split up into 16 hours each at one and a half of our modern day hours long. Uh, there's nine days in a week. But again, like I say, I'll, I'll do another video on the specific ins and outs of this calendar. I just wanted to do a quick video to make everybody aware that this calendar existed in the first place. Because for a long time I was not aware. And like I say, you're more than welcome to, to, to try and download. You can get a copy of the Slavic Area Invaders online, but if you don't speak or read Russian, it's, it's almost impossible. There are people that I've seen willing to translate it for a fee, but I am not willing to pay that fee. I will, or I am working on a translation myself, but it is painstaking. The, the, it is incredibly slow, and even getting access to the source material is, is almost impossible. I've, I've only got wee dribs and drabs here and there. But I hope you find this interesting, I hope this, this prompted you to go and look into this yourself, because like I said, there is there is some examples out there that we can use to, to form a base it's that this calendar was used. It blows my mind to think that for 7,000 years there was a, a unified history, a unified people, because how else would they have followed the same calendar? And then, as soon as that, that, that people were conquered, the calendar was changed. And as we see with Peter the, Peter the First, they changed the religion of the, the nation completely and the calendar. And that serves no other purpose than to destroy and alter, obfuscate, muddy the waters and, and to deliberately cover up the history of that people. Because if we knew our history, we would be far more powerful. Until the next video, guys. Peace.